Today we're talking about uh, hope. And I was thinking about hope this week. I was thinking about the various things that I hope for. And I don't know what things you might be hoping for. Uh, even when you come to a uh, worship service like this, within your heart as you enter into a place like this, is there hope? Is there a hope of meeting God? Is there a hope of gathering with fellow brothers and sisters to worship the Lord? Uh, is there a hope of the sermon being short today? What is your hope? <laughs> I hope that um, uh, you come and you connect with God today as you, as you are here to worship. I was thinking about hope as it relates to my family, and uh, I have hopes for my, my, uh, my marriage. You know, that Rita and I will continue to grow closer together, even over the years. We've been married for 22 years. And I think that uh, God has more for us. And I think that that is a, a great uh, um, kind of disposition to have, that our best years are in front of us. So uh, if you are married, or if you're engaged, is that your hope? That your best years are ahead of us? If you're single, what is your hope? Maybe your hope is to be in a relationship, to get married. This past week we were in prayer, and God put that hope on my heart, and I began to pray for all our single people. And just praying that God bless them. Bless them with the security of knowing that right now, as they're single, they're in love. Right now, as they're single, that they have the security of their, in their heart, that they are whole, and that God loves them just in the, the, the very state that they're in. God also impressed upon my heart to pray that they would get married. That those who want to, that have that desire, would find a relationship. I have hopes for my children that uh, they would grow to love the Lord. I have hopes for them that uh, they will, as they become more and more independent from us, they will grow to be dependent upon God. That's my hope for them. My hope is that they are emotionally healthy. That they are able to give love and receive love. My hope is that they could eventually uh, have gainful employment, and so I'm not providing for them for the rest of their life. <laughs> that is my hope. <laughs> and I hope that is your prayer for me. <laughs> my hope for them is that one day they will uh, get married and have great families, and I have hopes like that for my what about you? What are you hoping for? What is the things that are on your heart, the longings of your heart? Not only for your kids, for yourself, but for your church family, for this world. Do you have a hope that God is going to move in our midst? That God is going to continue to expand his kingdom through us? Is that your hope? Today we're talking about this wonderful hope. Um, we, uh, we know from Scripture what faith is. Faith, it says in Hebrews, is that it's being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Faith is about being sure and being certain about that which we do not see or currently possess. It's, it's really rooted in a confident trust in God. <coughs> The, uh, the unrealized promises of God we cling on to because we know that God is faithful, he's true, he's almighty, he's totally uh, and infinitely wise. But if, if uh, faith is about this, this confident trust in God, what is hope? Webster defines hope this way. It's going to come up on your screen. As desire accompanied by expectation of or belief in fulfillment. Let me read that again. Desire accompanied by expectation of or belief in fulfillment. Hope is similar to faith, but its emphasis is on the desire the desired thing that we are longing for. It's sort of ironic, I feel, that um, from the very earliest of age, sometimes we're taught 
to protect our hearts, protect ourselves, so we quench hope. Maybe you've heard people say to you, don't get your hopes up too high. What are we trying to do when we tell people not to get their hopes up too high? We're trying to tell them, protect and guard your heart. Because disappointment is a bummer. And so in order for you to protect yourself from this, this thing called disappointment, just guard your heart. Don't allow your heart to hope. Some people grow up with a philosophy that says, expect the worst, and then it'll always be better. You know, it's kind of that, yeah, just plan for it being bad. And if anything good happens, you're pleasantly surprised. But at least, if nothing does happen, you're not devastatingly disappointed. Hope. It's all throughout the Bible. It's our invitation from God. Without hope, the human soul withers and eventually dies. Hope is critical to life. There's a well-known pastor by the name of Charles Swindoll, and he writes in his book, Hope Again, this, uh, this quote about the vitality of that hope brings to our lives and what happens when we do not have hope. He says, without it, prisoners of war languish and die. Without it, students get discouraged and drop out of school. Without it, athletic teams fall into a slump and continue to lose. Fledgling writers longing to be published run out of determination. Addicts return to their habits. Marriage partners decide to divorce. Inventors, artists, entertainers, entrepreneurs, even preachers lose their creativity. Interesting, huh? What happens when we lose hope? It seems like the vitality of our very lives begin to wither and die. Today we uh, had Mark and Marlene light the Advent candle of hope. And uh, we're focusing on, on, during this Advent time, on Christ, his coming. He came historically and he will come again prophetically. And uh, within that message is the message of hope for us. The wonderful truth about Jesus coming is that Jesus took on humanity. But we can't make the mistake of thinking that because deity took on humanity, that somehow humanity destroyed his deity. Jesus is both God and man. He is fully God and fully man. And this, this paradox of the God-man is captured in that verse that Janice spoke of uh, at the end of the worship set, Isaiah 9-6. Isaiah 9-6 says this, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And if we were to stop there, if we were just to sort of cut off Isaiah 9-6 right there, we would be left with a very human child given to us by God. It might fill our hearts with sentimentality. Sentimentality that comes whenever we think of maybe a baby born, especially in very hard and trying circumstances. It might warm our hearts, but I don't know if it would give us much hope. And so we read on in this passage about who this child is. And it goes on to say, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. I think it's in this latter half of this amazing passage of the incarnation of Christ where we find our hope. That there is hope for a broken humanity. There is hope for a sin-stained world. There is hope for us who have lived foolish lives. There is hope for us who have control issues. There is hope for us who haven't been properly fathered. 
There's hope for those who experience anxiety. There's hope for those who have losses and pains. There's hope because the child is not just any child. He is a wonderful counselor. That means he is, he possesses wisdom beyond any other uh, on this earth. He is mighty God. That means that he is all powerful and nothing is too hard for him. Nothing that you are facing is too hard for him. He is everlasting father. That communicates the father's heart. That he has a father's heart for you and I. And he is the prince of peace. He is the one who possesses peace. He is the one to whom, when we are rightly related to him, we have peace with God and we have the peace that surpasses all understanding. That is what God gives us in the Messiah. So what do you see when you look upon him? Because today I've entitled this message, Look Upon Him, and we are invited to look upon him. We're not just invited to light a candle, but we're invited to allow the candle of hope to draw our attention to the one in whom we have our hope. And that is the Messiah, the child who was born. What do you see when you look upon him? The titles that he's given. These titles of Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace, they speak to us. They speak of his understanding of our need. They speak to us in terms of his understanding that we are broken and we are fragmented. We are oppressed and we are depressed. And the Lord offers us his salvation, a great salvation. And this salvation, it goes beyond just simply what can get communicated so quickly on a napkin or what can get communicated on a multicolored bracelet. Those things are good tools, but this salvation that God offers us is far deeper than we might ever imagine. It is the offer of wholeness. It's the offer that you and I might become whole. I think this uh, amazing truth of, of wholeness is, uh, is found uh, in the scriptures that uh, Isaiah writes about uh, later on. This very same prophet who gave us the words from Isaiah 9, 6 also gives us the words that we heard Marlene read just a moment ago. That uh, it says this, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has appointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. We are designed and created and redeemed so that we might be relationally, emotionally whole that we might be called, when people look at us, oaks of righteousness. You think about that, when someone looks at you and they see the way you're living life, they see that in the way that you are able to relate to others, they see the way that you are filled with goodness and righteousness and the way you give, and the way you are able to humbly receive, that they would say, there is a book of righteousness. There is a person in whom God's hand is obviously uh, been involved in creating because they look at you and they go, that must be God at work. That's our hope, that God is not just uh, saving us and, and going to take us and bring us into heaven, but the hope is that it begins now and that 
there's this amazing work that he's doing right now in us. That you could be a whole person. Look at how pervasive the, that Messiah's ministry will be. The hope of salvation will go out for those who feel like they've always been on the outside. And not it wasn't available to them. It would be preached. The good news would be preached to the poor. There's hope of emotional healing to those who are heartbroken. Have you been or are you currently broken hearted? Maybe over a loss of a loved one. It could be over a loss of a relationship. It could be just a friend moved away, a good friend, and you're missing that person. Over the years, I've had to say goodbye to a lot of people. Not just because they died, but because our lives have taken us in different paths. And in, that, in those losses, there's a piece of uh, my heart that gets broken as I don't you know, get to see them anymore. In this passage we see out of Isaiah 61, we see the bondage that people are in and the freedom that God gives them. Bondage to sin is a debilitating thing. And God knows our condition. And in this passage, he's saying, I want to free you. I want to free all those who are steeped in sin right now, who can't seem to fight their way out of it, who can't seem to manage their way out of it, I want to help them. I want to deliver them. There's words in this passage that speak of the darkness. Those who feel as if they are captives and uh, in darkness. I don't know what better terms and words to use that, that would describe maybe someone who is dealing with depression. Because when you're in depression, it just seems like the darkness is so thick. And when you look into your future, all you can see is that blackness. And yet God says that he wants to release you from that captivity. What wonderful hope that the Lord offers us in this child who was born and given to us. God it says in this passage, he's going to bring a song back into our hearts. He wants to lift us up and bring a song back into our hearts so that those who are mourning the loss of a loved one will find that comfort. They'll begin to sing again, and they'll be able to smile and laugh again. There's a... Uh, uh, author by the name of Erwin McManus, and in his book, Uprising, he speaks of wholeness. And he says this. I think this is very insightful. The scriptures describe us as being perfect and complete in this life. The best parallel word, word would be wholeness. The promise of God is not that we will be flawless in the world, but that we will be whole in this life. We have wasted too much effort trying to become perfect in our actions and invested too little energy in becoming healthy in our spirits. The perfection God promises flows out of the wholeness that only Christ can form in us by the love of God. It is a perfection that drives out fear and unleashes love. See, Jesus was the perfect whole human. He loved perfectly. He gave himself selflessly. He, he served faithfully. He was able to even receive graciously and gratefully. Jesus was able to forego the temporal in order to secure the eternal. He was disciplined. He withstood temptation. And he forgave those who succumbed to it. Jesus, he got angry at the things that we should get angry about. Jesus, he endured the unthinkable 
so that the hope of our salvation might be secure. He was whole. And God invites us and offers us to become like our Savior, to become whole. We're not going to be perfect in this life, but we can become whole. This is our hope, to be like Him, to become more and more like Him. This is what the Scriptures affirm. This is what it means for us to become like Him. That Jesus' best work <clears throat> is to take broken people, to take sinful people, to take self-absorbed people, to take greedy people, to take people who are filled with anxiety, and to make us whole. Amen. 2 Corinthians 3, 18 says, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. That's amazing hope right there, that God is moving us toward wholeness, to become more like His Son, Jesus. I talked to uh, Pastor Phil from Cornerstone, Tokyo, and um, he was telling me that at their recent gathering that they had, they uh, had a Thanksgiving dinner, and they invited their friends, and all these different people showed up. There's over 80 people that came out to this event. Um, that's a mega church in Japan right there. <laughs> and uh, it was wonderful, he said. And during that time that they were together, there was a gal who shared her testimony. And um, her testimony was very, very powerful because she had uh, been a person who suffered from a condition that's referred to as hikikimori, which is a condition of depression that manifests itself in, in isolation. So this person who is suffering from hikikimori, he will or she will stay in their room and not come out. And uh, they, they want to isolate themselves. They don't want to deal with any people. Um, it's very prevalent in Japan. Um, and, as, and as we know, suicide is very prevalent in Japan. And uh, this particular gal, she had, she had often thought about committing suicide. In fact, uh, she would go to bed uh, hoping that she would not wake up. When the tsunami and the earthquake hit Japan, she said that she was envious of those who had died. And she wished that she could have been part of the, the, uh, the victims of, of that uh, terrible tragedy. And yet she was there that night, just a couple nights ago, sharing her testimony. And if you were to see her, you would never know that that was in her past. Because she's come to know Christ. And she's come to grow in understanding who he is. And she's begun to receive his healing. And the brokenness is starting to be, be uh, healed. And now she stands and she's giving testimony about a life that she used to live, but that's in the past. And now she's living a totally different life. All because of Jesus and what he's done in her heart and in her life. It's an amazing, powerful testimony. And uh, if, if we could you know, interview everybody in this room, I would hope that somehow, it may be not as dramatic, but each one of us would have a testimony. A testimony of what God has done in our lives to, be, to, to bring wholeness into our lives. I'd imagine that we might hear people who said, who would share about, you know, I used to struggle a lot with greed, and now God is helping me to become more generous. 
I used to struggle a lot with anger, and yet it seems like more and more God has given me greater and greater amounts of patience. That was the testimony of a, uh, of a man that uh, I was uh, talking with a couple weeks ago. As we were sharing, he was telling me how he's now related to his kids, and he was saying he, that you know, ever since he's become a Christian now, he's so much more patient with his kids. That before, you know, when he would be helping them with their homework or, or doing things uh, with them, he would be so demanding and so hard on them. But now, it seems he's noticing he's so much more patient. And I think those are the testimonies that reflect that someone has encountered the living God. That someone has come into a vital relationship with God, and they are moving forward. Because if you continue to be stuck in the same thing over and over and over again, the same pattern over and over again, that means that there's something about your relationship with the one who is completely whole, that something isn't right. That we're missing something in that relationship. Because God is going to take us and move us toward maturity and completeness and wholeness. And it's a beautiful, wonderful thing when he does that, especially for your family members, because um, they begin to experience the blessing of your becoming whole. Now think about that. Wouldn't you love it if the people that you're closest with, say your spouse or your children, or your parents, if they were becoming whole, if they were starting to experience that, wouldn't that be wonderful? In your programs, you'll find a flyer. And in, that, in there, there's this flyer about this, uh, this special service we're gonna have on December the 13th. And uh, it's a Thursday night, it's, we usually gather for prayer on those nights. This is going to be a special night. We're going to have a time to worship together. Um, we're going to have a time to reflect together. We're going to have a time to pray together. But it's really designed especially, not exclusively, but especially for those who are mourning, who are uh, hurting. Maybe it's because of loss of somebody in their family, their close with, their friendship. Uh, people who are facing difficult times. Because the holidays, as great as they are, they can also elicit these intense feelings of loss, maybe of regret. And so we're gonna have a special service for those, again, not exclusively, but especially for those who are uh, finding this, this time to be hard. Um, I got an a email from Janice, who is sort of spearheading this, this evening. And it was, um, it was about, just about two years ago, when her own father was tragically killed in, a, in an accident. And I was so touched, because uh, out of that pain, and I'm sure there's still some pain there, she, though, is reaching out to others. She, she said that she was in conversation. She just noticed that there's others who might be hurting during this time. And she didn't sit there and wallow in her own pain. But she looked outward. And she said, let's, let's create a, an environment, a service, where people could come and, and receive uh, healing and just comfort during this time. And I thought, wow, that's so awesome. That's beautiful, you know? Um, and it's a, an expression, I believe, of someone who's on this journey of, toward wholeness. Because when you're whole, you're able to look and see other people. The most broken people are the people who only look at themselves. Have you noticed that? Those are the people that are always needy. They're like 
people, they're like leeches. And they will cling to people. And in their clinging on to people, they never give out anything. All they do is take. And some of us has ministered to people like that. Out of the goodness of your heart, you've come along some people and you want to care for them. And you find, though, that over weeks and months and sometimes years, what you discover is all these people do is take. They just suck you dry. I mean, you start, look, you start out looking like a grape and you end up looking like a raisin after being with them. Because they're so broken and fragmented that they don't give. But God offers us this pathway toward wholeness so that we can become like He is. Givers. We can go beyond our own pain and see the pain of others and begin to minister to them. It's a beautiful thing what God does in our lives. And as we think about and ponder, you know, last week we talked about being still, and this week we're talking about looking upon Him. As we look upon the one who is called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of Peace, we're invited to enter into all the things that He came to do for us so that we might be that type of person for others. This Advent, it's time to slow down, take inventory. Are there areas of your life that are still broken and fragmented? Are you in this ever-declining cycle of anxiety or depression? And God wants to lift you up out of that. God wants to lift you up out of that so that you could be a blessing to others. So that you could become a giver and not just a taker. That's good news. That's Advent. Right now, we're going to uh, take some time to uh, remember and reflect upon Jesus' sacrifice for us. And today, I think it's really wonderful for us to not only remember his sacrifice in terms of his securing heaven for us, but come to the communion table with the understanding that he, off he also offers us wholeness, that he wants to bind up your broken heart. That he wants to set you free. Free from the, the patterns of destructive behavior that you might be engaging right now. He wants to release you. He wants to bring light into your darkness. We have uh, also those who would be praying uh, for those very things for you. And they're going to be on the sides there. And so at our church, we uh, believe that the communion table... The bread represents Christ's body and the, the juice represents his blood. This is something that we, we take. We take the bread and dip it in the juice and we partake of it. It's for those who have said, yes, I receive Jesus as my Savior, as my Lord. And so if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're welcome to partake uh, of the communion elements. The prayer is offered for everybody. If you've never made the decision to follow Jesus before, today's a great day to begin. You can start right now. And if you just say in your heart, God, please forgive my sin. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Feel free to take communion. You might want to confirm that by praying with somebody. Um, this could be your very first communion. And that's a great thing. But whether it's your first or your 50th or 500th time you've taken communion, Make it a special time between you and the Lord. Get right with God. If there's sin to confess, confess it. If there's a commitment to make, make it. 
If there is prayer to receive, please receive it. Would you join me for prayer? We thank you, Lord, for Advent, this special time of the year where we could slow down and then we could gaze upon you. We could look to you, Lord. And we could see that you are the wonderful pastor. We need so much your wisdom, God. That the babe that was born is mighty God. That you held, you hold the world in your hand. And though you were nursed at the breast of your mother, you were at the same time holding the world together by the power of your word. You are our everlasting Father. Your heart is for us. You are the Prince of Peace. You are the only one who could bring peace to us. Peace with God, reconciling us to our Heavenly Father. And you also give us peace within the midst of our circumstances. This peace that surpasses all understanding. Lord, as we take this communion now, help us to enter into this journey toward wholeness that you offer us. That your salvation is broad and deep, deeper than what we've ever imagined. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name.